Why is labor against the war? Because the war is against working people around the world. This U.S. labor movement will be on the right side of the issues for if we have anything to say about it. I want to frame what I'm going to say by posing two questions. When does silence become complicity? And when does ignorance become culpability? These are two questions which, uh, with which organized labor must grapple today because these two questions have haunted our movement like an apparition in the night. The U.S. trade union movement has allowed itself to be buffaloed time and again by calls to patriotism, which more often than not is meant withholding criticisms, differences, etc., and going forward silently with whatever the government happens to say. It has often meant that we lock arms with big business, proclaiming that our interests are identical while workers on the ground are, being, are getting their clocks cleaned, while business is proceeding forward to enrich itself, and while soldiers and civilians are being killed if we happen to be in a time of war. Our movement, and U.S. workers generally, were more than prepared to settle into a cocoon of ignorance. Ask no questions and we would get no lies, at least so we thought. It was actually ask no questions and challenge no lies. As the living standard of the U.S. worker improved, too many of us were prepared to accept this as a trade-off for our silence, for our supposed ignorance. It reminds me all too unfortunately of an incident that was related to me from the period immediately after World War II in Germany. A young German woman asked her elders why they had not spoken up about the concentration camps and the extermination of the Jews. Her elders held up their hands and pleaded that they really did not know what was going on. The young German woman with a level of insight far beyond her years responded, you knew as much as you wanted to know. As I've been asking, particularly since September 11, 2001, at what point does silence become complicity? At what point does ignorance become culpability? At what point can we ourselves be challenged for denigrating the lives, hopes, and aspirations of millions of people around the world, upholding our own lives as somehow superior? At what point can we challenge the leaders of organized labor who claim to support international working class solidarity, but in the past have been prepared to either remain silent or participate in the subjugation of peoples who have followed a path different from that proposed by the White House, the International Monetary Fund, or the World Bank. U.S. law cannot remain agnostic about what the ruling circles seek to achieve. Our immediate challenge is one of confronting these cowboys, these terminators for global capitalism. At the same time, we can afford no illusions about the objectives of the First Among Equals crew. Their interests are not our interests. They may invite us in for tea or to feel our pain, but their objectives are diametrically opposed to our own. One of the things I used to wonder in AFL-CIO was how many times do we have to be kicked in the ass in order to understand that simple point? Sisters and brothers, we must find a way to speak with our members about what is underway. This is not about passing one more resolution. This is about speaking with our members and with those not in unions about what is going on. We must put in context what Bush is doing. This is not the first illegal invasion the U.S. has undertaken, and it will probably not be the last. But it must be the one that signals a change in the attitude and voice of organized labor. Organized labor needs its own foreign policy proposals, proposals that begin with the notion of the promotion of democracy, human rights, and self-determination. We are told to be patriotic, and at the same time, the corporate elite and their political allies are patriotic only to the U.S. dollar. U.S. troops are being killed in Iraq. Iraqi civilians are euphemistically re referenced as collateral damage, and one U.S. corporation after another gets an outrageous contract to pillage Mesopotamia. Tell me what this has to do with patriotism. Tell me what this has to do with human rights. 
The actions of organizations such as U.S. law, along with growing anti-war, anti-occupation forces, may be one step in the right direction. But that step must now turn into a quick and forceful charge against the forces of injustice. Anything else, any other course of action, will have our children asking us, why did you not do anything about the atrocities committed in your name? We will be unable to answer. Sorry, we did not know. Thank you. The war, brothers and sisters, is not just in Iraq, and it's not just in Afghanistan. It is in my hometown and yours. The war is in Washington. It's in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Cleveland, Des Moines. The war is in your city, your town, your community, and it's a war on you and on me. So why wouldn't labor be against the war on Americans who are out of work, Americans who are poor, Americans who don't have health care or access to a good education. Why wouldn't labor be against the war on Americans who are homeless, are sick, and Americans who dare to dissent, Americans who are patriotic enough to believe that we can do and make a difference? Why wouldn't labor be against the war and working people harassed, intimidated, and fired for daring to speak up for a voice at work? Why is labor against the war? Here are at least 87 billion reasons why. That's how many Americans' tax dollars are being siphoned off into the private pockets of the Halliburtons of the world while your hometown struggles to pay workers, to pave the streets, and to keep our hospitals and schools open. Why is labor against the war? Because ordinary Iraqi citizens and workers are not our enemy, but with every bullet, American soldiers fire in that country, George Bush makes another implacable enemy for our country because there can be no freedom in Iraq if there is no freedom at home. Because in my hometown, Washington, D.C., we don't have the right to vote for representation in Congress, because millions of Americans vote with their feet every election and stay home because they are disgusted with the sham our democracy has become. Why is labor against the war? Because the war is against working people around the world. One of the first organizations that we met with was an organization by the name of the Workers' Democratic Trade Union Movement. This organization represents the old guard of the labor movement in Iraq. To give you some sense of understanding some of the dynamics, this organization, made up of what I would call the elders of the labor movement in Iraq, many of these individuals have been driven underground by the old Iraqi regime, some of which were members of the Iraqi Communist Party. And one of the things that you need to understand <clears throat> is that Bush, in his attempt to present some fig leaf of diversity in the provisional government of Iraq, has a representative from the Iraqi Communist Party in the IGC. So this has created a dynamic 
where you have a labor organization that is, in fact, working with the coalition provisional authority, I call it the occupation authority, even though they are opposed to the occupation, they thought that the bringing down of the Iraqi regime was critical for democracy in Iraq. They are now faced with the contradiction that the coalition authority has no intention of bringing democracy to Iraq. How could they be interested in bringing democracy to Iraq when in 1987, Saddam Hussein issued a decree that prohibited the organizing of unions and the ability to wage strike by all public sector employers, employees. And you have to understand that even though Saddam was a fascist, Iraq was a socialist state. And as such, all of the employers, employees, longshoremen, rail workers, teachers, communication workers, Every major sector of the society was a state-run operation. So in effect, what Saddam did was to make unions illegal for all intents and purposes. This particular law is still in effect. And it made me think about something. Saddam Hussein was once supported by the US. That's a reality, as much as they tried to deny it. So then there was Gulf War I, or Desert Storm, when the troops thought they were going to go into Baghdad, the word was given from Washington to stop. And I realized that there was a reason for that, because they did not want the regime to fall. They wanted to have some semblance of that regime in place. Now they have taken Saddam out. His regime has fallen. But they are still allowing decrees from his regime to remain in place. Is there something wrong with that picture? Well, what that tells us is this. The coalition authority is not interested in democracy for the Iraqi people. They do not want to see collective bargaining and workers' rights and a voice at work for workers because their concern about making Iraq conducive for privatization. That's what this is all about. When um, the Saddam Hussein regime fell, those workers started to organize. And they had the help of the reborn Iraqi Trade Union Federation, the, World, um, the Workers' Democratic Trade Union, um, Trade Union Federation. And you know, one of the things that I learned in Iraq was that the labor movement in Iraq has a long history. It started under the British. They resisted the British and fought them during the six years at the end of World War I. And then when the British installed a king, and when we say resist, what that meant was we talked to a man who was a longshoreman in Basra. They organized strikes. Um, the British shot the strikers. Um, and they kept on organizing. And they organized an underground union. Then the British installed a king who ruled in Iraq until 1958, who also made unions and um, strikes illegal. And so workers organized despite that. So people had a very brave and a very bloody history organizing their unions. And then Saddam Hussein repressed those unions in 1977 and drove them underground. And I think that it's really a testament to that labor movement that as soon as he was gone, they started organizing again. Um, in Basra, they had a strike two days after the um, Saddam Hussein regime fell. 
a citywide strike. Um, they have a trade union council. They set up a trade union council, the equivalent of our Central Labor Council in Basra, within weeks afterwards. Um, and they had a trade union, um, they had a meeting in June in which delegates came from all over Iraq, about 400 people, in which they reorganized their federation in 12 industries. They sent organizers out to that refinery, and so as those workers were organizing themselves, organizers showed up from this federation. They helped them hold elections in all of the different departments of the refinery, and they elected a refinery-wide committee, and that's their union in the refinery now. They have one. Um, we visited two other factories, a shoe factory and a vegetable oil factory, um, in which essentially the same process was taking place, in which workers were organizing themselves with some help, in this case, from another um, trade union federation. But the thing that was really heartening to me was that under the difficult conditions that you can imagine, workers were not waiting one minute before they started organizing themselves for a lot of reasons. Um, and one is obviously the wages and the conditions, but the other one is, is that they all are looking at privatization and the entrance of U.S. corporations into Iraq as this kind of sword of Damocles hanging over their head. And they understand really well. They're not, you know, ignorant people. They've seen what privatization has meant in other countries, what happens um, when private owners come in and buy those enterprises. And so they want to get organized, not just to get a wage raise, but also to fight for the control of their jobs and to control, for the control of the institutions that they work for. And so what is it that they are meeting and they are having to deal with in that process? And what they're dealing with is the occupation authority. And the occupation authority um, has done a number of things. First of all, on the one hand, they've made privatization easier by issuing decrees saying, for instance, that 100% foreign ownership of businesses in Iraq is okay now, which it wasn't before, um, that you can repatriate the profits if you're a foreign owner and take them out of the country if you own oil wells or a factory or a mine. And they also, well, you'd love this one, they decided that the corporate tax rate in Iraq was going to be 15%. <laughs> they don't quit. So um, that's on the one hand. But on the other hand, you know, the occupation authorities are not stupid either. And they know that, you know, the idea of massive layoffs is something that's going to cause a lot of social dislocation and protest and a lot of angry people. And so they found a, a law passed by Saddam Hussein that they like, which was the one passed in 1987 where Saddam Hussein said anybody working for state enterprise is a civil servant, cannot organize a union, and cannot bargain. So, you know, you get the idea, right? I mean, these things are related, privatization and uh, laws against workers. Beyond just the question of are we in favor of labor rights, yes, we're in favor of labor rights, and we see a law like this, you know, we don't have any problem in knowing what it means or that it's wrong or wanting to get out there and campaign against it. But I think that there's some other things that we need to think about as well. Um, who is going to defeat the occupation? And when I say defeat the occupation, I'm not just talking about the military occupation, but what the Bush administration wants to follow it. Because they want a government in Iraq that is going to do what they want it to do. So in a way, you can consider that an extension of the occupation. Who is going to defeat that? Who is going to fight in Iraq for... Um, a government that seeks to preserve for Iraq the property that belongs to the Iraqi people. And what we're given in this country, in the media, and what we see in the newspapers and on TV all the time, is on the one hand, you see the soldiers, and you see the occupation forces, and on the other hand, you see the bombings. And the idea that we're getting sold here is that there is no society in, in Iraq, really. It's just bombers and soldiers. And I think what our obligation is, or what our responsibility and what we need to think about is that trade unions and Iraqi civil society, that's what's going to defeat the occupation. A political movement among Iraqi people is going to defeat this occupation. And we have a role to play into trying to create the political space for unions to organize and grow. U.S. Labor Against the War was only a few weeks old last February 
when we, like all of you, were doing everything we could possibly think of to try and prevent that war on Iraq. And we decided that we would take an initiative to reach out to other trade unionists around the world and see if we could create an international labor de declaration against the war in Iraq. And we did that. And we called upon the people in the United States that we knew had done a lot of international labor work. And lo and behold, before we knew it, in started pouring these endorsements of the international declaration from you know, the All Pakistan Trade Union Federation and the uh, All India Trade Union Federation and labor federations in Africa and the Middle East and Europe. And, and they came not only in their own languages, but in translation into English. It was phenomenal. And we came to find out that that was from the International Liaison Committee that had put the network that they had developed over the previous 12 years, they had put that network into action to build our international labor declaration against the war in Iraq. I think that the first consequence of your conference will be that uh, the resolution that you just adopted at the end of your conference will be translated in uh, a dozen of languages as soon as the coming week. Because the workers throughout the world need to know the decision that you took. And they need to know more specifically that you decided to launch a campaign asking for the withdrawal of the American troops in Iraq and also a campaign for the uh, implementation of the respect of the international labor organization conventions in Iraq, including the right for Iraqi workers to strike, the right for Iraqi workers to build their, their own union, to collective bargaining, or also uh, for the banning of child labor. And this is important because, not because America would have a special role in the world, not because America had the uh, specific role to lead the world, have some, like some people are saying, but because the, uh, the worker throughout the world look with a very, uh, very big attention uh, in the direction of the American labor movement. When they heard for the first time that something which is called US labor against the war is built inside the labor movement, this is of a tremendous importance for them because they think maybe this time we'll be able to overcome. Maybe this time we'll be able to join our forces with our brothers and sisters in all the countries, including the United States of America. And then maybe we'll be able to be stronger than the war mongers that the uh, uh, all those people who are sending hundreds of thousands of soldiers in our country and, and devastating everything. And that's why, since the beginning, we in the Inter International Liaison Committee, we paid a special attention on this question of U.S. labor of the world because we know that this is seen as a crucial question by everybody throughout the world. And that's why my suggestion will be that uh, as soon as possible we're going to translate this resolution and to ask the trade union and labor organization throughout the world to endorse the resolution. And to endorse it to make possible that in the ILO headquarters in Geneva, a delegation be received with the endorsements of labor and trade union organization in tens and tens of countries, asking together with US labor against the war that the basic elementary workers' right be respected for the Iraqi working class. And I'm sure that this international move will be able to have some step forward for the Iraqi people. What to me came out of this conference this weekend was an absolutely phenomenal thing. Amongst other things, the first one I'd like to mention is the fact that we had unanimity amongst everybody here that we were to you know, maintain our central thrust. And that central thrust is not who we elect in 2004, not what we do in, in congressional campaigns, but our central thrust is that the U.S. labor movement will never be the U.S. labor movement that it was during the war in Vietnam. This U.S. labor movement, 
will be on the right side of the issues for if we have anything to say about it. We are not going back to the dark days of the Lane Kirklands and the foreign policy that was complicit with repression around the world. And I think we've Thank you. I think we've made that very clear at this conference. And while this room was packed today, it was a delegated conference. So what we were doing here, we were representing organizations. It's interesting because someone told me that only one major international union has come out for the war. And it was an international union, I won't mention its name, but it certainly is much smaller than some of the unions represented in this room today. I mean, it staggers me that we had a, a union here today that represents over 200,000 people, one local union. And that's SEIU uh, 1199 New York, I believe. We then combine that with SEIU Pennsylvania 1199 and New England 99, and you're almost up to 300,000 people right there. I mean, to me, that's absolutely staggering numbers of people. And it's those kinds of numbers and those kinds of people that will carry our message forward and will keep our fight against this war in the forefront of the labor movement. We do know that there is a large segment of American workers who are not yet with us. They're not here, they're not on the streets yet. But when we go and we talk to people wherever we talk to them, in any union hall, and we say, do you know that the Bush, Bush administration sent our sons and daughters over there to support a regime, quote, change, that is installing a, a, a policy that is just as repressive and carrying out the same policies that the so-called uh, axis of evil person Saddam Hussein carried out. Do you know that that's happening in Iraq and that's what's happening at home? Can we support that? I think not. And I think that the AFL-CIO from the top on down will not be able to ignore our bringing this message into all of the right to organize campaigns on December 11th and into all of our unions and with that, I can only say that I think we have a hell of an organizing tool, a heck of an organizing opportunity, and I thank this conference for laying it out so very, very clearly and for us being able to maintain our unanimity and our solidarity in saying we have one purpose, and that is to defeat the occupation, bring the troops home now, and get the... Uh, wore off the backs of the American workers. So thank you for that. <laughs>